Okay. Now that we know what the layered architecture is, we go into what REST is. Uh, and REST is a so-called architectural style for network-based application software. So for anything that runs on a network, like the internet. Uh, and nowadays, most of our applications are somehow network-based. So it covers a lot. It's something that was originally developed by Roy Fielding, a guy that did his PhD uh, on this kind of topic. And what this style does is it tells you how to structure uh, a software that runs on a network. So how to basically decompose it into pieces and how they should communicate so that it's effective. Uh, basically, nowadays, a lot of these kind of network-based applications are web applications that use HTTP or HTTPS. So it's a very common use case, and that's why it fits into this course. Um, it is used heavily in the design of the HTTP standard and how URIs are structured. So. Uh, that's why I have that later, but that's why a lot of the things I talk about, you sort of, you will recognize from the way the internet works. So it's sometimes a bit difficult to to get across the point what's so special about this style, because a lot of you know many of the things. Uh, REST is a, is a combination of things, so it, it's not like a completely new invention. Uh, basically, it's a smart combination of existing uh, styles, how to structure system. One thing REST does is it talks about resources all the time. So everything is somehow a resource. And that's sometimes a bit difficult to understand. I already mentioned that in the second uh, lecture when we said HTTP returns a resource, but we'll get into more depth on that. Now, if we let the guy speak himself, uh, REST is about scalability. So we want to be able to scale our applications. Uh, and the interactions between them. And that's exactly what we have in the internet, right? You can have a lot, a lot of interactions, a lot of requests at the same time, and it's built in a way that it's scalable. We can have many users. Uh, the interfaces should be very general. So it should you shouldn't have inside knowledge of each application to figure out how to call certain things. Then very important independent deployment of components. Uh, and that's a very important thing in the, in the internet. Again, we have a heterogeneous infrastructure. So we have different hardware, different network standards, different operating systems. Uh, and this style is made in a way that this is easier to do. Um, intermediary components. So we can put stuff in the middle that somehow helps us to reduce latency, uh, that helps us to make systems more secure. Uh, and a very important thing, it helps us to encapsulate legacy systems. That means um, we often have systems in the internet that have been running for a long time, and it's hard to replace them. You don't, you cannot rewrite the whole system. It takes a lot of effort, uh, and the REST style helps to sort of put a server in front of it so that you can adapt it to maybe a new interface and a new kind of way of calling it, but in the background, actually, the same old system is still running. So you do not have to reprogram it, you just sort of slightly change uh, one component in your setup. Now, REST is just a style of structuring a system. Uh, and you often read about RESTful web services. Um, so that basically means you have a web application, a service in the web that is built according to the REST style. Uh, but REST is not exactly the same as a web service. So you can have an application that is strictly speaking not a web service, uh, but it still follows REST. So uh, this is confused a lot in the internet when you read blog posts and so on, but REST per se is not only about web services. It's a general way of structuring systems. Now REST stands for uh, representational state transfer. And that's a bit of a confusing acronym, but what it means is we transfer something, we send something across the internet, uh, and what we transfer is a representation of the current state of a resource. Now that does not help uh, a lot, I assume, so let's go into depth here. Let's assume uh, you request a Minesweeper board, not broad. So uh, assignment two, you request a resource. In our case, that's a board that tells you how the Minesweeper thing looks like. Uh, the server 
sends it back to you, it transfers something. And it sends it in the HTTP response. So that's the first part of our acronym. What the server actually returns is a representation of the board. It does not return exactly the same data as in the database. Uh, for example, uh, it might not return all the IDs. Like the MongoDB database internally has has another ID that depicts which version we have. Or there might be, in the Minesweeper case, I don't have that, but we might want to add information about how to solve the board. Or so uh, the server just returns some kind of representation of that. Uh, so I could send, in our case, I sent back a JSON string, but I could also send back a picture, for example. That would be a different kind of representation. Uh, so that's a difference. I don't uh, return exactly the same as in the database, I return some kind of representation of it. And then finally, I return the current state. So resources can change over time. Uh, if I would go in and change the board manually, for example, then the same resource, the same Minesweeper board suddenly has a new state. And the next time you do the same call again, you get a different representation because the, change, the state has changed. So that's really what it is about. We transfer something which is a representation of, of the actual resource uh, and we always return the current state of it. Now the REST style comes uh, or is defined as a number of constraints, as a number of things you have to do. Uh, if you follow these constraints, you are RESTful. Your system is RESTful. Uh, there is one exception and that's number six. That is defined as an optional constraint, so something you don't have to do. Now, as I discussed earlier, most of these things you have seen before, so there might not be that many surprising things. Uh, and I'll go in the following, I'll now go through them. Uh, five I'll do last because it's maybe the strangest one or the, the one you haven't seen before. Okay, number one, client server. So REST says the system should be built as a client-server system, um, which means there is a server that responds to requests. It does not send requests itself back to the client, so it just answers. That's a general setup. Uh, it's essentially, a, a, the idea is it's separation of concerns. So many user interfaces here can use the same server, uh, the same data, the same business logic. We don't care. Also, the user interface, the front end, can evolve separately. So I can change it, the server remains the same, uh, and that's great because I can, for example, have different teams working on these two components. Uh, and then finally, talking about the heterogeneity of the internet, uh, my server code can run in a completely different environment, in a completely different programming language, on a different operating system than my client. Uh, so again, we have seen this in the uh, assignment two examples. My backend, my Minesweeper generator does not care about what hardware you have, what operating system you use and so on. It's separate. The second constraint is statelessness. So that means uh, whenever you send a request, it contains all the information. Uh, and that's now a bad example because in the Minesweeper case, we, we did not use that. But for example, imagine you are in the Gmail application and the first uh, request you send is login. So you want to log in. Uh, that's the first thing you do. The second one is, for example, list the emails. Um, now, there are two ways of implementing this. You could say, first you log in then the server or the client remember that you're logged in. So when you send list email, it says, yeah, you're logged in, here are your emails. Uh, that would not be stateless because the server or the client would have to remember your first request. So the second request depends on what came before. Now, what happens actually in a stateless system is you do the login, you get some kind of information back, We'll cover that in, in security, but quite often it's like a number, a token that says this is your login information. And the next time when you say list email, you have to send this information along. So you say, for example, here is my token. And then the system 
doesn't remember this request, it doesn't need to know. The only thing it needs to check is, is this token correct or not? If yes, then list the email. Um, and that means each request contains all the relevant information. That's an extremely good thing uh, per se, because for example, if you want to debug something is wrong, uh, you only need to look at one single request. If my second request here depends on the first one, if the server needs to keep track of it, then I need to debug the entire history because something could go wrong in the first request, something could go wrong in the second one, um, but that's not something I have to do here. The, the next thing is uh, reliability. If I have a failure, if, I, if there's an error, I just need to resend the last request. Uh, if I would have a stateful system that something remembers, then I might have to start from scratch and first do login again, then do list emails again and so on. So it's more reliable. I, need, I don't need to re, uh, send everything. That's also a good thing for testing. I can test things separately. And then scalability is, is probably another issue. Uh, if the server doesn't need to keep track of the clients and what they have done so far and where they are, uh, it's much easier to build distributed applications because I could have multiple servers that do the same thing. So I could have another machine here uh, and yet another machine. And it doesn't matter whether the request goes to the first, uh, the second or the third thing. It doesn't matter because all the requests have all the important information. Uh, if it would be stateful, and I would, for example, log in on server one, then server two would have no idea about that. So I would somehow have to handle uh, that server one tells server two about it. If I have a stateless system, that's much easier. We don't have to care about that. So it's easier to build distributed applications, which is again, a very important thing in the internet. There is one issue with this. So most of these constraints are not perfect. They are trade-offs. Uh, and the issue is, the network traffic. If you need to send more information in each request, of course, there is more network traffic. There is more stuff you need to send over the internet. Uh, so that's a disadvantage we have. Um, that's something we have to live with. Now, the third constraint is cacheability. So this means if I do a request, the server needs to send back in the response, it needs to tell you can you cache this request or not? So basically uh, it has a yes, no flag here that says, yes, you can cache this or you cannot. Um, what this means is the client knows if I send the same request again, do I actually need to send the request or can I reuse the last response? So I save uh, network traffic, I save time if I don't have to do that again. Uh, and the user, of course, thinks that's great because the answer sort of arrives quicker. In reality, I never send a second request. I just reuse the first one. But it just means the response has to have some kind of information about whether or not something can be cached. There is, again, a trade-off with that, and that's reliability. So if I have implemented this in a bad way, then it could be that the client reuses information that is outdated. So for example, uh, I have a website that changes all the time. For example, it has live weather information. Uh, and if I tell the client, you can cache this website for up to two days, then the client would always get uh, weather information that might be up to two days old. So this might be unreliable. So that's the disadvantage here. Constraint number four is uh, basically follow the layered architecture style. So that's exactly what we discussed before, use a system that is somehow layered, no direct calls across layers, no backwards calls. Um, and the advantages are, as we discussed earlier, you don't need to know the upper layers, the backend doesn't need to know the front end, the database doesn't need to know the server. Uh, many upper layers can use the lower layers, and it's easy to replace and to add and remove layers. So that's, uh, there's nothing new here. That's just what we discussed earlier. The trade-off is, uh, there's always a trade-off. Here we have additional overhead. If we could do a direct call to the database, it might be quicker. Uh, so there is more, there are more HTTP requests, there's more processing going on. 
compared to doing it directly, uh, which might take longer because each request takes time, each processing takes time. That's a disadvantage. Okay, now we jump over the fifth one. I said I'm doing that last and we go to number six. So remember, this is an optional thing. You don't have to do it, uh, but it says you can send executable code back to the client, code on demand. Uh, and this allows uh, the client to be extended with additional functionality. So our business logic does something, but on top of doing something, it can also send some code to the client, the client and execute it. Uh, and that's the advantage. The client does not have to implement this functionality because it comes from the server already. Uh, the trade-off is somewhat visibility. I mean, the code is being sent to the client, so the client can, of course, see the code, can change the code, and so on. Um, this might sound like a very strange constraint to you because uh, we have been doing this all the time. So every time we had an HTML file that included JavaScript, that's exactly what we did. We sent the JavaScript file to the client and the browser executed it. So that's something we already did a lot. Uh, but I'll do an example later based on HTTP, which explains all these parts. Now, finally, uh, we have constraint number five, which is called uniform interface. What this says is there should be a uniform way, a general interface that is used by all the clients. Uh, so whether you're, you have a laptop or a mobile phone or another server, you call exactly the same uh, interface in the same way and it doesn't matter where the request goes if it goes to a small server a large server or the post office the call is exactly the same uh, that's actually one of the key differences to to other existing styles for network systems um, but it's again something that you're very used to so you might not be uh, seeing the point here directly this one has four sub constraints which i'll go into uh, there is again a disadvantage and that's efficiency. If you can tailor uh, an interface specifically for a component, uh, it might just be more efficient. It's not as general, it cannot be used by everybody, but it's very suitable for exactly that component. So for example, if you use a mobile phone to uh, send something to the post office, you can do an interface that is specifically designed for that. Um, if you do the same interface to work with all sorts of servers and all sorts of clients, it has to be more general, uh, which might not be as efficient. Okay, let's go into the sub stuff. Uh, there are four of them. The first one is about how do we identify resources? So how do they look like? What's the naming of them? Uh, second one is called manipulation through representations, which we'll get into, self-descriptive messages, uh, and then the horrible acronym, which is called Hypermedia as the engine of application state. Hate hey, OS. Um, that's a tricky one. It's hard to understand. Uh, the, the acronym is even more comp confusing, but I'll tell you all about it. Now, first one, identification of resources. We already talked about that REST is all about resources. Everything is a resource. And what we mean by that is typically business objects, something in your business domain, whatever you are programming uh, that exists. If we're doing a Minesweeper application, our Minesweeper board is a resource. If we do the solution to the Minesweeper thing, that might also be another resource. Uh, in the internet, we have documents, we have images. If we have, uh, for example, assume you have a logistics application, so something that allows you to make orders and maybe send things, then maybe we have uh, resources like order or payment. Uh, we will later on take, an, take a look at the PayPal API, uh, which has these kind of things. You can order in PayPal, you can make payments and so on. So it usually depends on what kind of business are you doing, what are you implementing, those are your resources. Uh, every resource in REST can somehow be identified, so it has a URI. Uh, and this is again something you have seen. On a website, each image has a specific URL. There is some kind of way of addressing that image, of identifying it. That's exactly what it is here. Uh, in the Minesweeper case, there has to be a way to create Minesweeper boards. Uh, 
there is even a way actually to receive a board with a certain ID. There is some kind of way to identify each and every board. Uh, and of course in PayPal it's the same. If you create an order, you have to somehow identify to do something with it. So that's the first thing. We want to be able to identify our resources. Uh, then we want to uh, encapsulate them. We don't want to directly interact with the data, for example, directly do database calls. Instead, what we do is sending representations. So that's what I discussed uh, when, we went, when we discussed what REST stands for, that we only send back a certain representation of the data instead of the actual Minesweeper board in my database you get, just get a JSON representation of it. Uh, and if you want to change it, in the Minesweeper case, you cannot, but in many other cases, if you want to change the resource, if you want to modify the payment in PayPal, you send back JSON. Again, you send, what do you want to change? Uh, you do not directly send back, okay, please take this new piece of data and write it into the database. Instead, you tell the server how to change it. Now, self-descriptive messages is a very important one uh, that makes it easier to use things. The idea is every request can be understood by the server in isolation. There's all the information what we need. Uh, for example, what kind of representation do I want to have? If I send to the server, please give me a new Minesweeper board, I might have to tell the server, I expect you to send JSON back because that's what I understand. Uh, when we use HTTP, we, for example, that's one way of doing it, uh, we typically use the verbs, the different methods, get, post, and so on, to tell the user to explain how we are, uh, what we are want, planning to do with the resource. So for example, if we do a post request, we say, please create a new resource. If we do a get request, we just say, please read the current state, please give me the thing back. So. Again, in Minesweeper, what you're doing is you do a post request. So you're telling the server, please create a new Minesweeper board and send it back to you. There is another uh, call, which I have not told you about, but in, in my application, you can also do a get call uh, and tell the server, please give me the board with a certain ID. Then there is not a new one being created, but it checks in the database, is there a board with ID five? If yes, send it back. So we often use these verbs to identify what exactly we want to do. That's one way of having messages that are very clear, they're self-descriptive. You don't need to understand uh, the API in all detail to know what it's doing. And we'll be seeing that in, in the PayPal API. Last one, uh, hey to us, Forget about the acronym because it's really just a horrible, weird way of, of describing what's going on. What it's all about is essentially whenever you return a resource, for example, a Minesweeper board, you also should send back a number of links uh, that tell the, the receiver what they can do with it. So this is something I haven't done and that's something uh, most people don't implement in their API. Um, but what I might do, for instance, if, again, in the Minesweeper case, if you do a post request, uh, so you basically tell the server, create a new board. What I should have done is uh, send you the, the resource back. So you get somehow the, the board ID uh, five and you get the actual board and so on. And then additionally, what I might uh, have sent back is something like links that says, okay, with this board, by the way, you can also do the following. You can actually do a get request. So if you do get, uh, and then a URL, if you do get slash five, then you're additionally able to read the board in the future. Uh, so it's basically just a way to provide additional pointers of what you can do with a resource. Uh, so in this case, you know that you can create one, but then you get the board back and you don't know what else you could do. Uh, if I add these links, I might be able to tell you, well, by the way, you can also get it. Uh, you can also delete it. You can also do whatever. So it's kind of providing additional links.
So that's now uh, an overview of what the REST style is. And I would expect that by now you are pretty confused of what this actually means. So we'll do one example, uh, which is the most common one, the one that you are most used to. That's just the way websites work. So we'll look at that because websites, HTTP, the internet, follow the REST style. Um, and then later on, we'll have a look at uh, more practical advice. We'll design a REST API ourselves. So uh, websites, HTTP is the main protocol in the World Wide Web. Uh, and REST has been used to develop HTTP, as I said. So that's why we see all of these constraints in typical websites. So the first one is the client-server constraint. That's what we do all the time. We go to Wikipedia and say, please give me the website, the resource that tells me about URLs. Uh, that's exactly what we do. The browser then receives the HTML file, it draws it, it renders it, and you can interact with it. Uh, Stateless, this constraint is fulfilled because HTTP is stateless. So that's what we discussed in lecture two. Uh, by default, there is no state in HTTP requests, which is, for example, very different if you look at the TCP protocol. Uh, so the TCP protocol is sort of first initializing a session, a connection to another server. Then when that is done, you can send data and at some point you close the connection again. That's very stateful. HTTP is by design stateless. Cacheable uh, in HTTP, and maybe we just look at that. If we make a request, let's go into my network view. Uh, if I, for example, go to Wikipedia, and I want to know about URL, um, I've done a request. And if you look at the response headers here, what it says is cache control. So this tells us about how can the caching be done, and I won't go into the details. Uh, it might go, there might be a number of other things, cache, there's a bit of uh, details. But essentially, the HTTP protocol has, in its headers, it has a way to tell me about, yes, you can cache, or you cannot cache. So that's built in into the protocol. Uh, so that's our third constraint. Um, the fourth constraint, layered system, is also implemented in, in this case. When, when I send the request, I only know the target URL. I know that the, the URL is wikipedia.org slash something. Uh, I don't know where this URL gets the data from. So most likely uh, behind the, the Wikipedia server, there's a database or a number of databases uh, and it makes a call there and it gets the data back. But I have no idea about that. I don't know where the database is and I don't know how to access it either. And that's of course a great thing because if I would be able to directly access the Wikipedia database, I might cause a lot of harm. Now, the uniform interface uh, is again something that's inbuilt in HTTP. Uh, it's just that we have URLs they are a standard way of identifying resources. So the, the U in the URL stands for uniform, and that's exactly what we want to have. So the, they are somewhat uh, descriptive. I know that if I put, uh, if I write a re URL here, I know that, okay, this is the server, this is the protocol, uh, and this is the path, for example. Uh, they are somewhat self-descriptive if you know details about how the URLs look like, you are able to understand what it is you are calling. Uh, and then finally, we have the code on demand thing. Well, that's as I already said, we are loading one resource in this case, we are loading the HTML file. But as you see here in the network view, there is a whole lot of other stuff that is being loaded, like CSS, JavaScript, more CSS. And that's actually code on demand. We are downloading, the server sends us uh, additional code that we are executing on the client side. So that's exactly just the sixth constraint. Uh, so websites are a very, very common way that implement the REST style. Uh, if, we if we dive into the details of the fourth constraint, uh, 
we can look at, at all the details. So I've already said we use URLs. What we actually do is we identify resources. We have a unique way with a URL to identify what we want to have. Uh, if we manipulate anything, so for example, if uh, something is changed on the database side, data in the database, only the representation is sent. So for example, if we, uh, if we want to create a user account, we do a post request and we send some kind of uh, body, username, password, and on the server side, something is created, some user account, but that's not exactly what we send over. So we just send some kind of representation, the post body. Uh, we have somewhat self-descriptive messages, so the verbs in HTTP tell the server what is going to happen. Is it a GET request? Is it a POST request? And so on. Uh, and hate to us is actually, I would say, that the clearest case is HTML, because we have, in an HTML file, we have lots of links to other things. So, of course, you know all of these things. That's basically hate to us. It's telling us what else to do where to continue from this resource. So we have, we don't have to know the details of all the different resources on Wikipedia. That's what the links tell us. By the way, you can also read about web resources. So that's hate to us uh, in the website case. All right, so this has been fairly abstract. Uh, so Either you have been confused by it or it has been obvious. So why, why do we even think about this uh, or both? So the question is really, what do you get from REST? Uh, and would like to go back to the, the original definition. Uh, the constraints we're having really give us the scalability we have in the internet. So that's why the internet can grow so well. Uh, the URLs help us to to navigate the internet, they really make things clear, but we are very used to it. Independent deployment is something we don't even think about, but we have all this separation in the internet that we have clients, server side, databases, load balancers, caching, uh, and we don't even see them. And all of this is essentially why the internet works so well, why it scales so well, uh, and also why it's so heterogeneous. It, it does not depend on a single organization to run it or something like that. Uh, and that's really the power of REST. Now, that's why the internet works. That's all fair. We know that it works. Uh, but we now get into how we build our web applications in a RESTful way. So uh, similar to the internet, the internet is scalable. The internet is general. If we build a web application in a RESTful way, it means this application is most likely scalable. It's fairly general. You can understand it. Uh, it's easier to change, it's easier to maintain than other applications. Uh, and if we do this, if we build a backend that is following the REST principles, then we have a so-called RESTful API or a RESTful web service. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, to do that, we'll use one of the many checklists because REST is quite abstract. So if you want to build a web service, you often have these checklists like number three that tell you concretely what should you do. Uh, I only cover parts of them because I think some of them are more relevant than others or they're maybe so advanced that they don't belong in this course, but rather in the web services course. Uh, and what you'll see is there are a lot of checklists out there that talk about how to do REST, uh, but most of the practical advice has nothing to do with, with the actual REST style. So you can implement REST in a very different way. Uh, we anyway, uh, this practical advice is usually useful, so we consider them sort of to be part of the best practices. So also when I uh, discuss in the exam or in the assignments to follow these best practices, then it means also follow the practical advice that has nothing to do with REST itself. Okay, so this was the theoretical part uh, of what REST is and what it gives us. Now, in the next recording, we will start building or designing a RESTful API uh, for a certain application. And then in the last part, I will just show you an example of the PayPal API, uh, maybe another one, just to show you that if you follow these REST styles, uh, you do not have, it doesn't take a lot of effort to understand how web services work. If you follow the best practices, uh, 
the web services are sort of self-explanatory. But we'll see about that later. 